to the first in a series of interviews I'm going to be doing this year with a number of business experts. I'm Mary Jane Mapes. My interviewee for the day is Moeed Amin. Moeed is a sales consultant, he's a trainer, a coach, and he's worked in over 400 different companies in 10 different industries. For over 20 years, he has been obsessed with how and why people make the decisions that they make. You'd like to know that, wouldn't you? His journey started when he graduated in neuroscience, which is where he learned about the evolution of brain structure and the impact that has on the psychology of decision-making. Decision-making is increasingly important, not only for our organizations, but truly for our entire lives. Fast forward several years and Amin has won several sales awards and he was recognized as a very high performer, having been responsible for turning around uh, struggling uh, business divisions as well as entire organizations. Now, if you're in sales, you're going to better appreciate this, but he was mentored by one of the top 10 sales authors, Max Dixon. So please help me welcome an amazing man with an incredible um, depth of knowledge regarding neuroscience and the impact that has not just on sales, but on decisions that we make in our life. Please help me welcome Moeed Amin. Welcome, Moeed. Nice to have you here today. Thank you, Mary Jane. It's, it's good, to, uh, good to speak with you again. Thank you. And so we have a little cloudiness here in uh, the state of Michigan. I know you're not in Michigan. In fact, you're not too close. So why don't you tell folks who are listening to this where you are? Yes, I'm, I'm in uh, United Kingdom uh, in London. It so, is um, wonderful. Well, cloudy here and cold. So it was one degree Celsius. I'm not sure what that would be in Fahrenheit. I think it's just in the 30s. Mm. Um, it's early cold. low 40s so it's it's pretty cold today um but they say it's going to be sunny tomorrow so um still cold but it's fine yeah well i the thing that i think is so terrific is that we can be anywhere in the world today with the um use of zoom or whatever other technology that allows us to communicate virtually and also makes business in some ways so much easier yeah i mean it's um i mean you, you couldn't go back to the 90s and and say say we you know if we had a lockdown in the 90s it would be a disaster in a lot of ways right um and it's it's you know people say that this is the best time in ever in human history to be alive and look there are problems but we've always had problems except that our lifestyle is such a way that you know, our grandparents would just think it's fantastical what we're the world that we're living in right now. We can talk to each other across the world and see each other in real time. I mean, that is that in itself is amazing. So, um, yeah, it's 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 fantastic that we have this kind of technology, and and I think it's going to uh, it's going to develop in leaps and bounds in a very short space of time because well we seem to innovate a lot faster and better when we have real desire to do so yeah isn't so, that yeah. true and it's wonderful because i've made friends from different parts of the world people i would never know but that's not why they people are listening to this today they're no, listening no. to this because i believe your interest in neuroscience and specifically as it relates to sales. But if we can talk for a minute about neuroscience and how you got an interest in that in the first place, like where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, at school, I found that I had an affinity and enjoyment for the science sciences, specifically around biology um, and psychology, actually. So it felt natural for me to, um, go into a neuroscience uh, degree and study it at university or college, as you say, in the, in the US, United States. Um, so I studied it, but I didn't really have any idea of how I was going to apply it as a career or vocation. But, but what I did know is that I enjoyed it. Uh, I also thought about, you know, the social structures and dynamics in our society today. You know, all of that came from, from an idea. Um, 
at some way, shape or form. And those ideas are formed based upon, largely based upon uh, our neuroanatomy. So I know that if I wanted to study the source of things, it felt right to me to study neuroscience because that is how we created the world around us really. And humans are really the only organisms that we know of that can shape their environment to their will. Um, so I studied neuroscience at university and um, from there, you know, fell into sales and I applied my understanding of neuroscience and particularly my side learning of cognitive psychology, behaviors, decision making um, into my sales career, which made me really, really successful. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the rest is history, as they say, but that's really how it started. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the human mind is, is amazing. Everything that's ever been created really came from some thought from someone. It all started in our brain, our minds. Um, when you think in terms of neuroscience, and obviously it was a big body of, of, of work to study, what were, if you were to say, wow, this was probably the biggest aha that I had, whether it's, a, was, it's a psychology, behavioral psychology, whatever. While I was studying at the university or while I was applying it? Or both? You know, while you were, well, let's do both. While you were studying and then while you actually applied it. I think for me, it was the, 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 the anatomy of the brain and the, the, the structure of our neurons. In the last five to 10 years, because of the advancements in technology, uh, our understanding of the brain has, has, has grown leaps and bounds since then. Back then, we still believed that our mindset, our, our, our intelligence was fixed. You know, IQ, you know, we had an IQ, can't really go beyond that. Um, but we now know that that's not the case at all. In fact, we know that our brain is absolutely, it's plastic till the day you, that you die. Um, so the, the anatomy of the brain was what fascinated me the most. And as I dug deeper and started learning more and more after I'd left university and I was trying to apply it into my sales career, that's when I branched into the cognitive psychology side of things. Because for me, yes, the structure was important, but the structure also determined how we conducted ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. The structure determined why feelings are so important when it comes to memory, for example. Um, the structure also determined why, um, and Daniel Goleman's book on emotional intelligence mm -hmm. um, is a great example of, of, of someone who conveyed this publicly, you know, why we have an emotional reaction to something far quicker than we have a cognitive thought or higher level thought about it. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the part that really fascinated me more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And then what about, uh, what was the biggest aha then as it related to once you started putting what you learned into practice? Because that plasticity is just critical. Yeah, I mean, we, we know now that your brain, the structure of your brain, and I'm not talking about anatomically now, I'm talking about the wires, right? All, right. All, you know, all the wiring in there. We know that actually that is almost uh, it, it's, it's structured almost as a mirror image to how you perceive your environment to be. Mm -hmm. So it's constantly changing. So there are all those little neurons, <laughs> little pathways and how they connect and yeah. how all that yeah. works together really determines pretty much your life, doesn't it? So you're constantly building it. Uh, sometimes it's being broken down if it's not being used. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, what fascinated me the aha moment for me was that um, the brain is encased in darkness. One in three of the cars that you see suddenly are the very car, is the, is the very car, sorry, that you've decided to buy. Yeah. Yet, if you thought about before you made that decision, did you really see that particular car as often? Most likely not. No. And that's your reticular activating system in, uh, going in place there. Because... You know, that, that really is an excellent um, example of exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Because I've I always said, you know, when women get pregnant, they don't think about it. Well, at least I never did. 
till I was. Now that's been uh, quite a few years ago, but still, then it seemed like the whole world was pregnant. When I got my first car example, it was a little Cutlass Sierra, it was yellow. And I was just thrilled with that little car. And then I got on the road and my gosh, it was like every car, exactly what you were saying, was almost like the exact same car. And I thought the world is made up of Cutlass <laughs> <laughs> Sierras. That's been a no. few years ago. But well, quite a few. And years. look at the layers of bias. And I mean, that yeah. works in business as well. It does. And, and if you, you will see certain things in a certain way, and, and if you dwell on those things, your brain is literally trying to find answers to, to validate what you're already thinking. Let me ask you this then. You know, you've had this, you've had this education, you've worked with people, helping them use this to make better decisions, to... Um, really improve their life, their performance, the works. Yeah. Yeah. How has it made a difference in your life specifically? The short answer is it's made me far more aware of my feelings, how I'm perceiving things. It's enabled me to ask questions. Doesn't mean it always happens because I'm human and those, these feelings and emotions are a very human mechanism. It's an evolutionary um, thing. But it has made me more aware. So if I do spiral, I feel that I'm a lot quicker, in a much quicker way, I'm able to bring myself out of it by using the techniques that I teach to, to, my, kind of, to my clients and sales. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely made me far more aware of my own feelings, my own actions, how I perceive the world, how I even view my place within it. And more importantly, my own internal motivations, my intrinsic motivations. Mm. You know, I work with leaders. One of the things that we talk about is that the importance of your motives, because you may not have the skills. I know people that have all the right listening skills, and that's something for years I've taught listening. You can lean forward, you can look people in the eye, you can nod your head, you can give listening responses. But if you're trying to manipulate and your motives are not pure, all the right external moves on your part, really people see right through it to what you're really trying to do, whether it's manipulate, whatever it is you're trying to do with them. So how does that work in the brain? Oh gosh, that, that, that's a complicated question because ah. there's, there's, a, there's a lot involved there. So firstly, let's take the example. Yeah, exactly. So let's take the example that you shared you know, where if, you're, if your internal motivation is being incongruent with your body language. People talk about the emotional center of the brain being the, the least evolved or the earliest, uh, earliest mm -hmm. created in our evolutionary cycle. And they incorrectly assume that it's therefore the least evolved, the least sophisticated. Mm -hmm. That's actually not true. It's actually incredibly sophisticated mm -hmm. because and that's my view here and the, and the view of the people I've spoken to, including my professor. Um, think about it, 100,000 years ago, uh, we didn't have to think high level thoughts as frequently as we do now. The dangers around us were very different. Right. In fact, the dangers were instantaneous in a lot of ways, right? An, an alligator snapping at you when you're taking a drink of water or something potentially jumping up behind you, you know, from the bushes. Right. Um, you cannot, ha you don't have the luxury of higher level thinking to then say, what are the probabilities here? Is that really that kind of sound? Uh, you know, if I move this, this way in this angle, I could probably avoid it. No, you, you don't have the luxury of that time in order to do so because this is a life or death situation. Right. So these emotional centers of your brain and the, and the, and, and the elements of the brain, like the hippocampus, for example, uh, that it's connected to, are designed to make very quick judgments. Yes, they're incomplete. Yes, they're full of holes and full of biases and expectations and memories of things years ago that you can't remember the detail for. But what you do know is that if I hear that sound or see that sight, that translates into fear and therefore I must take this action. Right. Survival first, think about it and reflect on it later on. Right. What you've described, and so why, I'm, why am I talking about that? Is because what you've described is something that we call incongruency. You're saying something, but your body language is telling something completely different. Mm -hmm. And we are trained naturally to sense if someone is disingenuine. 
we may not be able to consciously be able to identify, hey, this person's done this thing there on that body, their shoulder slightly. We may not know that, but we do know that something is wrong. Because back then, 100,000 years ago, our survival was based on having a close knit of our tribe, mm. right? If there was someone in that tribe that, was, that could be dangerous to us, it would be dangerous to the whole tribe and our whole survival, our very survival. So we're almost trained to notice if something is missing. And what you'll find is that people will just say, and your brain is designed to do this, will mm -hmm. just say, take the safe way out, don't trust them until you get further information. Mm -hmm. So it's like maybe those little nuances of body language, it may not even be anything overt. But it may not, to may not be everything of those little a flick of the eyelid or a, a it may not be a it may not be it, it, it's not necessarily one thing it, it, it it's well, and that's why i use the right. word incongruency because it could be a multitude of things that just doesn't seem right they don't fit together right. Mm -hmm. right it's like someone um and you might have seen this in analysis of you know murderers and things like that on tv when you see these body language experts right right they will show a video of someone that is um expressing remorse but then they smile a little bit mm -hmm. right and that's why someone might say well that person's guilty they don't necessarily know it was the incongruency between the smile and the words that they're using but there's something there that's showing that hang on i can't trust this person right i know during so, the latest in this country anyway political campaign which i don't yeah. go into but during the latest political campaign i noticed on the internet they had different body language experts analyzing yes. both you know both presidential candidates and they would identify there were like five different people that were all giving their feedback most of them were pretty much the same i mean they said it a little differently but they were all picking up and I guess they've trained yeah. themselves, right, to pick up on little cues because they're very intentional about looking for those incongruencies. So I, yeah, so I have a. So do you do this in sales? That's what I'm wondering. Yes, we do. But we have a. I have a friend and colleague um, who is regarded as one of the best in the world when it comes to body language and human behavior. His name is Mark Bowden. Mm -hmm. And and what we do in sales is, and, and he advises this. He says, take it from an expert don't try to translate the body language and to understand what's going on mm. because you won't unless you're obsessed about it like he is where he studied it for decades then he could but even he doesn't draw absolute conclusions from things that he's right. observing right because you know, have you heard this thing where people say well if your eyes move up to the right that means you're thinking about things and it's maybe it may not be true that's like an nlp thing yeah, but what if you see a what if you see a fly? Right. Right. <laughs> Better you know, know the context. Right. So you've got to know the context. What we do in sales and what I train, I don't want to say what we do in sales because these are quite sophisticated things. Not everyone applies this. But right. what I certainly train is don't try to translate. When you feel a cue like that, ask questions to get more information. Like get curious get curious mm -hmm. it's the same thing that we, i talk to when i talk to sales leaders when you are in a situation where you're in you're, you're talking to one of your team members in a meeting and doesn't something doesn't feel right ask questions don't assume right so use use that natural evolutionary mechanism as a cue rather than an answer mm -hmm. and that's that's my advice there um because, you know, you mentioned sales and obviously it's sales teams. That's one of your big, uh, you know, client groups that you work with for sure. Um, you help them get, you've helped them get some teams, some very big results. Well, yeah. we all sell something. Now the people watching this are going to be people that may sell a product or service. Maybe they're just trying to sell their idea. Yes. So totally. what can you tell yeah. us about the psychology of buying behavior that might help the rest of us when we're selling to somebody. Yeah. So the first thing that we have to think about the, the psychology of the buying behavior is that there are layers to this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The first and easiest layer is we are all motivated by two main category of things, fear and desire. That's it. Just those two things. We either fear something that we want to avoid or we desire something so strongly that we want to move towards it. Mm -hmm. 
And what you need to remember is that the other person's fear and desires are not the same as yours. I know this sounds very obvious, yeah. but we become so engrossed in our own world that we find it weird if someone else doesn't feel the same way. Right. And I, I, I talk about sales, but let me give you an, an example from uh, a work that I've done in the past where I worked with heads of R&D, right? Research and development, innovation, people, innovation in big companies. Mm -hmm. They're constantly trying to convince stakeholders to invest resources in a breakthrough innovation, mm -hmm. a big innovation, which has inherently more risk, more time, rewards are 10, 12 years down the line sometimes. Um, and they're trying to convince them to come together and to commit resources, whether that's money, time or expertise, right? Mm -hmm. And they can't seem to understand why these individuals are not doing so when they provide them with all the logical answers the NPV calculations, Monte Carlo simulation, break-even analysis, all those things. Uh -huh. And that's because they don't seem to understand that we are motivated and driven. Our decision-making is predominantly driven by emotions, fear mm -hmm. and desire. It turns out that even in innovation, when you look at those analysis, the reason why they don't commit is because of emotional reasons not logical reasons. doesn't mean logic is not involved, it's emotion, but it, there's a large part of the emotional reasons that are not being addressed. So the so first thing to, yeah, yeah, please. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, the first thing to consider is, what does this person fear and what does this person desire? Yeah. Right? Maybe that's the, uh, that's the basis then for that old saying, the high road to reason is a pathway through the heart. It really What's is. the thing they're fearing or desiring, which is it? Really, it really is. I, it really is. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into the techniques of how you understand, how you elicit that, and kind of understand that. That that's a very big topic. You can't just ask people outright, but there are cues that you can listen out for, and once you build their trust, then you can start to ask slightly more direct questions. Mm -hmm. But remember that there is something that someone fears something that someone desires or a few things that people fear and desire fear desire yeah that's great as um I, you're a co you do coaching uh i do coaching we both do coaching so we know that we have to learn to listen to look to really pay attention um yeah. so that we can like you say get really curious about what's what's actually going on with that person yeah and and those the next, the next thing to remember is those fears and desires are not really work-related, um, especially for a leader. That's good right. to talk about. Let's yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you work with leaders. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of ego involved, but the ego is not necessarily malicious ego, right? right? It's mm -hmm. actually they've spent so much time, energy, sacrifices that they've made to get to the position that they're in. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to jeopardize that because, you know, and sometimes people, those leaders will fear uh, a dent in their reputation, but it might not be reputation, right? It could be, yes, you may dent my reputation, but that reputation helps me feed my family, mm -hmm. right? Helps us live the lifestyle that we, that we have right now, right? Um, or it could be that, look, if, if I have to go down a level, after having worked so hard, that would absolutely crush me. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily work-related and we forget that when we're in the work environment. We're not there, work is not always the end all and be all of our lives, right? There's an emotional element that's very personal to us. Mm -hmm. The next thing after fear and, fear and desire is human needs. And there are, several frameworks for that you have tony robbins six human needs you have abraham maslow's hierarchy of needs but what you need to remember is that every, every human being is driven by a need which then satisfies that fear and desire or that fear and desire is connected to that mm -hmm. so if we use just the six human needs just for simplicity's sake you know these will be things like the need for significance to be noticed mm -hmm. right there's the need for certainty Right? And we all have an element of these, but they're usually- And we're living in different. such a time of uncertainty today. Yes. That creates a and lot we, of fear. I've seen that in organizations working with leaders that, um, and it seems like 
that that fear really can drive people back, and I do mean back, from being very effective to retreating to where they felt safe. Absolutely. And this is, and here's, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And here's why it's so important to understand the predominant needs that an individual has that you're talking to. Because if you talk to someone who's one of their predominant needs is the need to feel certain, to feel safe, mm -hmm. and they're in this environment, you can completely understand the fear that they're going to be feeling and they will retract. Yeah. However, and this is why you have to think about the individual. There are people whose dominant need is variety, right? Change. They love it. They thrive on it. That it, would be me. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, the thought of certainty is dull and boring. Mm. Are they going to react to this COVID pandemic differently to the, that, that of certainty? Absolutely. Yeah. So if you assume that the person you're talking to is going to be fearful like you about the pandemic, you're setting yourself up for a, for a failure there almost, right? Mm -hmm. So significance, the need to be noticed, right? Certainty, variety. You also have love or connection, right? Mm -hmm. You have contribution, the need to contribute to others, contribute to your community, your loved ones, to the world at large. Mm -hmm. And you also have growth, the need for growth, to constantly grow, to constantly improve, to constantly take a step forward. Right? So you've got fear and desire, mm -hmm. and then you've got the human needs. What is driving that individual? Is it significance? Is it certainty? Is it growth? Is it contribution? Mm -hmm. Because their decisions are going to be congruent with that. Mm. Um, there's a saying that Tony Robbins has, which is people will violate their own values to satisfy their human needs. Oh. That's why human need is so important. That is really good. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I had an experience. This is years ago. I was working with someone. I won't even say what field they were in, but it was uh, very successful. And I commented on the success of this person, that he was such a go-getter, that he was such a... He was so like, boy, he just went after what he wanted. And that drive, I, I admitted, I admired that drive. And he said, uh, yes. And he said, you know, it scares me sometimes mm, what I'm willing to do for that. And it was interesting. I never forgot him saying that. And when I walked away from that meeting, I thought, what, I wonder what he's talking about. Well, it wasn't all that much later, like maybe six months, eight months later, he was actually arrested and sent to prison because he got mixed up in some kind of Ponzi scheme or something. Right. Yeah. Ah. Uh. So I wonder what his needs were. Right? Good. Good question. Um, yeah. You know what, what? And and unfortunately, the majority of people fall in, have the the two predominant needs are certainty and significance. Mm. And, and, and we, we all must have an element of, I mean, we can't live our lives in uncertainty all the time because that would become hugely stressful. We have to have an element of certainty as a foundation. Um, and, I think, and I think some of us want significance. We want to live a life of significance. That's different, I guess, than you being significant. Ex but, but if it dominates the purpose and the reasons right. for the actions that you take, rather than maybe things like contribution, right. for example, right. then it becomes a problem. So it's all a balance. Right. Um, so fear, desire, human needs. And then the next thing is our, um, it, it's called our social profile. And there were two psychological researchers, and I use I use their research because it's really simple, and it's also used quite extensively in the corporate world mm -hmm. um, uh, by the names of um, uh, Merrill. Um, gosh, I can't remember the second gentleman's name. Um, it will come to me. <laughs> I'm having a bit of a brain freeze there. Okay. But but um, uh, what they did was they found that. Um, Human beings socially, right, in terms of their social profile, psychological profile, fell into four different types of categories. You, you've got the drivers, you've got the analytics, you've got the expressives, and you've got the amiables. And each one of those individuals are 
motivated. They, they have specific likes and dislikes that are very different from each other. Mm -hmm. And that also translates to the language that they use, mm -hmm. right? which is really important. Language is an expression of thought. You can argue that without language, there is no thought, just right. feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. So the language that they use as an analytic versus a driver, very different. Yeah. They're motivators, right? Connected to the human needs, very different. The analytics view their world in a very logical way. They take their time to make decisions. They want all the facts first. Whereas a driver is all about speed. Mm -hmm. What's the direct path forward? I don't really need to know the details as long as I'm satisfied that it's accurate. Mm -hmm. What is the path forward? How do we get there as fast as possible? How do we get to that goal as quickly as possible, right? Whereas an amiable is more relaxed. They're all about loyalty, right? Have you ever come across someone where you're trying to sell to them or you're trying to give them a coaching course, for example, and they're already working with someone, but what you have to offer, you know, and they know is far better than the person that they're already working with. Mm -hmm yet they won't leave them. And we normally assume because it's change management, and it could be, but what if that person's an amiable? Because to them, loyalty is so much more important. Right. Right. So, so the social prior profile is very important because of what the path that they want to take to satisfy those human needs, mm -hmm. right? The language that they tend to use for themselves and how they see the world, mm -hmm. and also how they view the world. Right, what is important to them, right? right? Mm -hmm. So those are kind of um, th three things that I would say are very important. We the buy at least a high level of the psychology right. of the buying mm -hmm. process because all decisions lead to those things in some way, shape, or form. Right. Hopefully, does um, that make sense? All, yeah. Oh, it all makes sense. Yes, absolutely makes sense. Ooh. And I think that Carl Jung. I don't know if that's who you were thinking of that's who i think of when i think of the the social profiles that you're talking oh, about meryl no it's meryl reed sorry meryl i just reed. remember the name meryl reed uh -huh. uh, two cognitive cognitive psychologists uh who i think it was in the 70s if i'm not mistaken uh where they they kind of came up with those four uh profiles well, i think there are a number of um, profiles out there yes that that they're similar they're very similar and the they, disc the disc profile, the disc profile uses is very popular yeah they use it heavily right yeah. so mm -hmm. uh, and there are subsets of different drivers and if you happen to be close to a driver and an amiable you know that might mean that you're motivated by different things but don't worry about being accurate just worry about what does this person feel to be towards right is this person a driver in which case how do i need to talk to them and, you know, and that's where you start to talk about matching and mirroring which is nlp mm -hmm. right if you talk in analytical language to a driver, you're going to really bore them and they're going to get frustrated. And the way they respond to stress as well mm -hmm. is very different across those four profiles. Mm -hmm. right? So you have to be very cognizant of that because you don't want to do something that, that's stressful to the amiable. But if you do, by any circumstance, observe that, or, or if they are stressed, you want to make sure what are the cues that are telling you that they're stressed so that you take a different tact, a different approach. And you know what's interesting that I think, uh, Moeed, is this is some years ago now, but I was working with salespeople on some communication things and I had them take the role of different, I use different yes. terminology, but the different, you know, social profiles. And I had them determine who they were going to be. And one was going to be, I'm going to use your language, you know, the amiable, but this person was really a driver. The first thing out of his mouth is, well, what do you have for me today? Mm. What's the bottom line? Yeah. Well, an amiable probably would not start there, would they? No, they wouldn't. wouldn't begin no. there. No, they would be all about the connection with the individual. Right, right. So I think what you're talking about and what you work with just seems to be incredibly important for people. But I have a different question for you. It takes us in a little different direction. But I work with a lot of senior leaders and organizations to help them become more truly authentic. A lot of times when people say, oh, authentic, you mean I just come in and say, this is who I am. I just, no, that that's not what I'm talking about. So, but so that they can do a lot of what you're talking about and that is be in charge being able to manage themselves be aware of their mind their emotions their body being able to do all that and being 
able to be authentic so that they're not coming from that place of fear that you're talking about. And I always say capable of creating a culture of fearless participation. In other words, where people have a voice, where people are respected, where all people have a sense of dignity. Sometimes though, they come to me and they say, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm authentic. I mean, I'm not fearful. I'm blah, 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 blah. But when I speak to, let's say, members of the C-suite, and this, these are people that may be VPs. They even may be somebody in the C-suite that's speaking to the board members. They'll come and they'll say, boy, you know, I don't know what happens, but I just, I'm not succinct. I ramble. I just, it just seems like it all falls apart. But what do you, what, what would, what would you say to them? Like, what's going on in them that they would need to consider? The first thing that we have to, so, so there are, there are four ways that I look at this from my own research mm -hmm. um, that determines your mindset. Mm -hmm. Because what's important to remember, have you ever heard that saying that perception is reality? Right. Right. Well, it's not true. <laughs> um, feelings, your emotions are your reality. Yeah. And that's because in the five stage process of sensory to action, you have number one, which is the sensory, right? So this is maybe this, this is probably the neuro, neuro, neuroscience point of this, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, neuroscience part of my answer. You've got sensory, which is taste, touch, smell, all those things. Mm -hmm. Then you have perception, right? What mm -hmm. is my perception of what I've just sensed about my environment? And this right. will be based on many factors. What is my, what are my feelings about that perception? good or bad. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what will my thoughts process be? And then what will my behavioral action be? Mm. So your feelings determine what your thought and behavior are going to be. Um, you can change your perception by changing your feelings. If your perception of something is bad and you have a bad feeling, you can change your feelings and therefore you'll perceive something in a better way. But can you also not change your thinking and therefore change your feelings? No. Well, so what's interesting is that your thought process, see, it now goes up to the high level process. And that high level process is in a large way based upon what your thoughts and feelings are. For example, um, you will remember something in more detail and clarity if you have a really good, have you ever noticed that you will remember things that you really, really enjoy, even if it's very complex? Mm -hmm. versus something that you really don't enjoy, but it might still be simple to remember, but you just mm -hmm. won't remember it as long. That's because yeah. your emotions are intrinsically connected to how we decide whether we're going to remember something or not for okay. the long term as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not, that's not the case. What's, in, what's interesting is that um, the thing is, even if you change your thought process, right, it's still the tail end of the, of the, of the first three steps. And if you change your perception and feelings about something, your thoughts will then change and then your actions will change. So what I would say to those leaders, in those, that particular example, mm -hmm. a couple of things. Um, so there are four steps to this that I recommend. And these four things, if when done right, will radically change your mindset. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say in any given situation because there are some situations that are quite distressing, mm -hmm. um, but later on they will certainly help. So the first thing um, is the meaning that you take from something. Some people will go into a room with sea levels. I've done this. This was part of my job for 15 years. I sold almost exclusively to sea level executives in multi-billion dollar companies. Mm -hmm. And I was only 30 years old odd at the time. These are 50 year old individuals. It's the usual kind of conundrum and situation where a salesperson tries to match someone who's 20 years their senior. Mm -hmm. And you have that inferiority complex. The meaning that you take out, so some people can walk into that room and have a completely different meaning to even that C level person that walks in the same room. Right. right? So the meaning that you take from a situation is very important right? Is this an amazing opportunity? Or, you know, you know, this is a great opportunity, but I'm not too scared. What's the worst that they can do? Mm -hmm. right? 
yeah, where someone will then say, no, I'm a C level. If I don't come across well, they're going to fire me. I'm going to lose my reputation. So the meaning that you take from a situation is very important to your mindset. Um, number two, the language you use. I talked about this earlier. Language is an expression of thought. Mm -hmm. Without language, you can argue there is no thought. Right. If, and I've spoken to a number of people during this pandemic situation, right? Uh, this is disastrous versus inconvenient and challenging, but we can overcome it. Right very different meanings from mm. that right very different thoughts because they stir up very different emotions disastrous challenging mm -hmm. very different emotions so the language that we use is very important to our mindset most people talk about motivation mm -hmm. i i totally think that motivation is absolute rubbish it's 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 um what i call it is um uh, self-questioning mm -hmm. right is the questions that you ask yourself right self con it's con self convincing you so the language use is really important are you using the language of going sea level ooh, scary or sea level experienced mm -hmm. right so the language you use is very very important and then the next thing is your body language your physiology Emotions come from the neurochemicals that your brain releases throughout your brain and your body, right? Um, if your shoulders are hunched and your eyes are downcast, you're shuffling your feet nervously. Forget what it might look to the other person that's looking at you. To yourself, you're almost kind of hacking your body and your brain by basically saying, I am nervous. Right. Versus if you are sitting up, shoulders back, you're breathing more fuller, right? And you're relaxed. Your voice is projecting in a more confident way, right? Because there's more air going through right. your lungs. You will feel better, right? This is not about having power poses, right? It's a, it's a controversial research. But there's research that shows that if you do a Duchenne smile, which is like your widest smile, your most genuine smile, um, they, they did this research amongst... Um, people who were suffering from mental illness, right, and depression. And they were tasked with every morning for five minutes, you had to look at the mirror for two weeks and just smile. Mm -hmm. That's it. Even if you didn't feel like smiling, didn't feel happy, you just looked in the mirror for five minutes and just smiled. Mm -hmm. They found that those that did that versus those in the control group uh, felt, I think it was something like 40 times happier and they were 40 times more positive about their view of the world and their place within it. Mm -hmm. These were people that were um, in hospital, right? These weren't just people that were suffering from mild kind of depression, though. These were people right. that were hospitalized due, due to it. So even smiling creates a physiological change in your body and it releases neuro neurochemicals, right? Mm -hmm. The happy neurochemicals mm -hmm. versus the more depressed ones. So body language is very important. And then the final one is focus. We talked about this with the reticular activating system. Mm -hmm. What you focus on determines your perception and therefore your feelings. If you constantly focus that they are with your sea levels and they're scary and if, or if you, sorry, if you constantly focus on don't mess this up, don't mess this up, don't mess this up, you're kind of telling your brain that you're going to mess this up. Mm -hmm. But if you focus, for example, on rather than saying being positive and being happy because it's too big a leap, but if you focus on curiosity, mm -hmm. I'm going to approach this with a level of curiosity, which means that I might do a bit more of my homework, right? Mm -hmm. Competence is very important, right? You can't just have a great mindset, but not be competent, right? And a lot of the times, if you don't feel competent, it's because you haven't done your homework. You're not as prepared as you would like to be. Right. Therefore, it feeds your mindset. So it is a circle. Mm -hmm. But, but so there's, you have to do that. That's also important. But if you're coming at this with a, a focus of curiosity, then you're going to be more curious about the people that you're talking to. Ooh, mm -hmm. How is this person going to respond to what I'm saying? What is my practice response to that? Right? Or how am I going to overcome that objection? Right? Am I prepared for this type of meeting? Right? Um, 
And a lot of the times it's because maybe you haven't come, come at this with a level of curiosity. Mm -hmm. You're probably nervous and you haven't really done your homework about that. So those are the four things right, that so, I usually recommend. So then let me see if I can recall what you've just said. Number one, you said it starts with a meaning that you give to something, yes. right? It starts with the meaning. And so then the meaning you give to it, if, can, is it safe to say that if you become aware of the meaning that you give to it, then you can indeed change the meaning that you're giving given to it by changing the questions that you might ask yourself. That you can then, then you also have to be aware then of the, the language that you're using to describe it. Yes. And you could say to yourself, is this language going to be, is this language, is what I'm saying, even if I'm saying it to myself, is this going to get me where I want to go? And if the answer is no, then maybe we can say, well, then what, what language will? What words will, right? What words yeah. will, what language will? And then finally, uh, the focus. Where am I putting my focus? Yeah. And yeah. that if we go in, whatever it is, and we get curious, we come back to the word curious, then that changes the entire focus of that, if it's between two people, that interaction. Yeah. And body and language. Body language is <laughs> another huge part of it because, well, and when Very you were good. talking about, I think, well, mind and body primarily work together. Yes, absolutely. So we can either allow our body to destroy us, basically, you know, like, oh, or we can change that body and the physiology. And when you change the physiology, you change how you feel, you change how you feel, you change how you think, and then you probably change your focus. So it all kind of works together, doesn't it? Yes. And, and there's, there's a final thing that once you understand those things, there's a final thing that I would, I would do. And I, I do this mm -hmm. with my, with my clients is you need to break that pattern. Yeah. So you're in a cycle where you're thinking that you need to break that pattern. Mm -hmm. The more ridiculous and the more completely distant and irrelevant the pattern that you use to break your situation, mm -hmm. the better. Because you literally shook your brain to think, well, what's going on? And it's, it almost makes it more open to new suggestions. How would, they, how would somebody do that? Can you give an example? Yeah. Watch a, watch a, a, a comedian that you find absolutely hilarious. Mm -hmm. Watch, watch, watch two minutes of that to break your pattern. Oh, uh, switch on music that really gets you pumped up, music that you absolutely love and get your body moving. Mm -hmm. Break your pattern. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, um, have you ever noticed where people, um, the old saying where, the, where if you go up to, um, for public speaking and you're nervous about public speaking, picture everyone uh, just wearing their undergarments, right? Oh. That's a very basic form of pattern breaking because right. it's so ridiculous that mm -hmm. you can't help but laugh if you truly do imagine that, right? right? So, so the more ridiculous, the better. Mm -hmm. Because if it's ridiculous, your brain literally goes, whoa, whoa hang on, what is that? Because it's, it's designed to do so. It's designed to look for incongruency, for salience, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, but make sure it's something that makes you feel good at the same time. It can't be something that's, that breaks your, breaks your pattern in a bad way. Right. <laughs> like looking at a horror movie, for example, or getting scared. Although sometimes getting scared will do that. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, that. That's for very skilled people to do. Yeah. Well, we could go on talking about this, I can tell, for a very long time. <laughs> but um, I just think that what you've shared with people certainly is helpful. It certainly gives them a lot of food for thought, giving them some great ideas. If you were to provide people with one last um, piece of advice, or I don't know that that's the right word, if, that, if that's the right thing, advice, but what's the one message that you could leave people with that would be helpful to them? What's the one thing they could do yeah. that would achieve something that you've talked about? Pattern interrupt. Um, change perception, whatever it might be? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because they're all interlinked, so it's very hard to choose one. But I oh. guess what I would say is um, your emotions are your reality, right? And they are the reality of the people that you are engaging with. 
be more cognizant of the emotions that you are going through. If you're annoyed about something, don't just take it as a given and continue down that annoyance route mm. and, just say, and just say, well, I'm just going to carry on with my day because you need to address it, change it in order for you to then move forward, right? The, the way that you have the emotive, let's use an example of failure, okay. right? Fear of failure. I don't even use the word failure. I use setbacks, mm. right? Because it has a very different meaning, but let's just use the word failure because it's very commonly known. Mm -hmm. Person A will view failure as a disaster and therefore a real setback. And it's going to be very difficult to come out from. Person B, someone with a growth mindset, will say that this is an, in, an integral part of the journey for my growth. And without it, I will never get to the level that I really need to. Mm -hmm. Their emotions towards failure are very different. So be more cognizant and aware of the fact that emotions are so central and core to how you conduct your life and how your, the people you interact with conduct their lives that if you take the time to understand that a little bit more, you will find that you'll have better relationships with yourself, better relationships with your loved ones, better relationship with your colleagues and your community and the world at large, mm. um, whether that's in business or in personal life. In fact, in business, I would say it's even more important because studies show that business is for more emotive, far more emotive than in personal life. There's a lot more emotions going on. Yeah, okay. In sales, they found that B2B sales has far more emotions than B2C. So be more aware and cognizant of how important emotions are and start to think about whether those emotions are serving you or not. Yeah. And are you understanding the emotions of the people that you are talking to? Mm -hmm. Because you will probably find out that they are upset about something that's not to do with work, but something else in their personal life. If you address that, you address the performance at work in a lot of respects. Oh, that's excellent advice. Excellent advice. Well, I knew I would get a good interview when I spoke with you the very first time and you certainly did not disappoint. I'm glad. If people listening to this say, you know, I'd like to know more. I'd like to find out what he could do perhaps for my sales team or for me as an individual, because I'd like to be more powerful as a salesperson. How could they get a hold of you? Yes. So um, a few ways. Um, so you can email me. Uh, and we can provide that we can provide the links so that you can share this. Uh, but it's uh, M Amin, so my initial M and then surname Amin at proverbialdoor.com. So if you know the philosophical, the proverbial door to get your foot into the proverbial door, so it's all one word.com. Uh, you can have a look at what I do on my website, www.proverbialdoor.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. There's a ton of things on LinkedIn. So Moed Amin, uh, so LinkedIn forward slash Moed Amin. Uh, and I also am um, doing things on YouTube. So the proverbial door cha um, channel on YouTube has quite a lot of information and videos of people that I interview. And I'm also doing a lot more videos of my myself sharing things and best practices with them. But the most direct way to get in contact with me is through my email, mamin at proverbialdoor.com. Wonderful. And I will have that information, you know, on this video, I'll have it in the uh, info, the, the, the text as well. So they'll all have a way of getting in, in touch with you. Great. So I want to thank you so much. Um, I'll let you know when this is being published. And um, I wish you all the very best. And I hope we keep in contact with one another. For sure. Yeah. And thank you so much, Mary Jane. That, that, you had some really insightful questions, really great questions there that made me think as well in, in, in quite a bit of way. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. And yeah. I hope it's, uh, I hope your viewers find this very useful. I, I really do. I will. Thank you so yeah. much and have a happy and prosperous uh, 2021. The same to you as well, Mary Jane. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye now.